Hello, welcome to the Donahue Group. Glad you could join us uh, for some good conversation about issues facing the state. Um, we're in a jolly mood here today in spite of um, the trails and travails of, uh, of the election. At least at the beginning of the program. At least in the beginning of the program. <laughs> progressively grim as we move on. And I'm gonna introduce my fellow Grim Reapers, uh, Ken Risto, social studies head of Everything in the Sheboygan Area School District. I think that's a very sophisticated title. Trying to choreograph popcorn. There you go. Uh, Cal Potter, former state senator, gracing us here today. Uh, Dirk Seilman is joining us. Uh, Tom Paneski was uh, not able to be here because of his mom's death, and, and so we asked Dirk to join us. And uh, Dirk, of course, is a radio personality. Was and a radio personality. Was. Oh, I didn't we don't, know we don't that. have local radio anymore. Ah, well, that's true. Well, we'll get into that. We, we <laughs> might even get into like that. <laughs> In any event, uh, wow. Dirk Zilman, former vice president of something or another at Lakeland College mm -hmm. of Development and things like that at Lakeland, uh, now chair of the town of Mosul. And on the otherwise known as Paradise. Otherwise known as Paradise, um, where the taxes are low and the quality of leadership is high. And the people are happy. Yeah. And, um, Oh my, <laughs> his annual meeting's coming up, so we're getting ready for that. Um, <laughs> Everybody above him. You know, and I forgot to introduce myself last time, and so I'm gonna do that right now, and then the introductions will have taken up 10 minutes of our, of our show and we'll be fine. Mary Lynn Donahue, small town lawyer at O'Neill, Cannon, Holman, DeYoung. <laughs> And a big I, firm. <laughs> and I mentioned that because I was out in the community and somebody said that the name of this show was the Ronald McDonald Group. And they got somehow Donahue and McDonald all messed up. So oh. for those individuals at Brennan's Tavern, it's Mc, it's not Ronald McDonald's. I think maybe after a few beers. And Marilyn, either, I would be offended if I were you. <laughs> and I'm so offended all the time that it just kind of, you know, I wear out after a while. Well, and I'm mad. I'm See, mad about. I told you it was going to get grim. I'm mad about the Supreme Court race. Ah. Mike Gableman, 51% of the vote statewide. Yeah. 62% of the vote in Sheboygan County. Lewis Butler, 49% statewide, 38% um, in the county. I think, it, I think that race was a crying shame. Uh, I'm nearly speechless with my um, really deep dismay about the uh, 527 or independent expenditure groups that, in, in my opinion, absolutely ruined this race and uh, reduced it to and let me just say, for a Supreme Court justice, one expects some dignity, some truth, some attention to the qualities of the person who is running instead of Willie Horton ads and millions and millions and millions of dollars being spent. Um, frankly, on both sides, distortions. I, I think clearly more on the Gableman side, without a doubt, but you know, on both sides. Uh, and we're used to misrepresenting kinds of ads, but I guess my question is, when does this stop? Does it ever? I mean, it we keep talking. Unless you have some type of change in law and how we finance court races. And I think it's, uh, you're, you're right on the money. It, it, I think people ought to not only be disgusted with the way the campaign was run, but how the campaign actually treated the voter. They took the voter and said, you're dumb as a box of rocks. You don't even know the difference between a Supreme Court race and a trial court. And we're going to portray this in a way that you won't even know that it's, we're talking to you in an erroneous manner. I mean, they simply went, they went back and said, this is like a trial court uh, judge and we're going to take case, how they would rule in a trial court setting. And you don't know that, but we're going to tell you which candidate is better based on this premise. And I think people ought to be ticked off that any group would come in and have you looked at in such a demeaning manner, like you're a bunch of, you fell off the turnip truck or something yesterday. That's how this was really conducted. And it was, it's a dirty shame. I think there's, there's some momentum for public financing uh, of particularly judicial uh, races. The challenge is I don't know if that's going to solve anything unless you somehow figure <laughs> exactly. out how to put a handle on those 527s because I don't know if I saw either a Gableman ad or a Butler ad during the campaign. I saw all the special interest ads. Well, you did see the Gableman ad where he... In, in, my, in my opinion, and I, I'm not sure that the complaint with the Judicial Commission will go anywhere, but where the, the representation, it was a Willie Horton ad. They put Butler's face up with uh, you know, a guy that he represented who he did 
on a technicality, have the case dismissed, Supreme Court reinstated the sentence, the guy served a full term, after he's done, then he goes out and he reoffends. but the commercial leads you to think that Butler, number one, did it as a trial judge, not as a public defender, which is what he's paid to do, and that's why we have a constitution that says people are entitled to present a defense. I mean, it's a fairly key cornerstone of American philosophy. So there was all of that stuff going on. That was Gableman's ad that really incensed all sorts of newspapers and commentators and said to Gableman, take it off the air, and he said, I'm not going to do it. But as I understand, the Judicial Commission is already hedging its bets, saying the Supreme Court has told us that misleading ads are okay. It's the ones that are outright, outright lies that are not okay. And, well, and so... And, right. Uh, the fact that you're a public defender, that is a position that should be respected. As, as you've said, people need, if, if they're brought to trial, if they're brought into court, they need somebody to defend them. And the people that do that are really, in many cases, the heroes of our society because they, they defend some of, the, some of the people that are almost indefensible. But that's what our system is all about. And that was a very unfair ad. Uh, some of the ads, though, against Gableman were pretty unfair. The bobbing yep. head, uh, he paid, gave a contribution to McCallum, and then he got his judgeship and all this sort of thing. Um, and I think you have to, you can't forget that Butler four years ago ran and got whopped by Diane Sykes and then was appointed to that position. Um, we haven't had an incumbent Supreme Court justice beaten in over four, four decades. It was think, George Curry from Sheboygan oh, no. who was uh, defeated. But, uh, you know, I, I think that what, what disturbs me, and, and, and I think that there were some challenges with Butler. I mean, he was way off on the edge in terms of some of his judicial uh, decisions, particularly regarding business and that lead paint and all that sort of thing. But I just don't get the sense that Gableman was a very quality. I mean, if I would have been okay if Butler had lost, but had lost to a really quality, kind of middle of the road judicial candidate. Uh, but isn't but, it interesting because Butler is one of the centrists, or was one of the centrists it was, it on was the court. Interesting and, uh, to read that, that he was kind of the conciliator uh, on the court. Uh, and, and, see, no, and I think that's the point uh, that you hit on, Dirk, which disturbed me was the money that was funding those, those ads as distorted as they were, were primarily Wisconsin Association of Manufacturing. And their issues with Butler were exactly the ones you just outlined, that there was a variety of, he was on a decision-making process where they disagreed with his decisions. Well, then let's talk about that. Let's talk about, don't vote for Justice Butler because in those decisions, here's where he came down. This race never talked right. about a single decision he wrote while he was sitting on, on the Supreme exactly. Court bench. I don't think you have, there was a single positive ad on either side. It so, was always yeah. bashing. Exactly. And, and so, you know, Cal's point is, is not, only the dis, not only the distortion that if you didn't know better, you'd think he's sitting in a trial court, you know, opening the jail cells. People were voting against Butler for an agenda that didn't exist so that the Wisconsin Association's hidden agenda Good is now me. is now very, very possible because we'll see how justice the new Justice Gableman rules on some of these business decisions. Well, I mean he's fairly beholden to, you know, like Molly Ivan says, you gotta dance with them what brung you. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, I think um, you know, it's 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 hard. It's a little scary he's what, forty one years old, so he could mm -hmm. literally be on for yeah. a long time. Yeah, and I mean, truly, Abrams is going to face the same nonsense. Well, it, and we'll get to that in just a minute, but I want, I want to beat the Gableman <laughs> Butler horse here just a little bit longer because, um, first of all, it wasn't just Wisconsin Manufacturers Commerce. Mm -hmm. It was WEAC and the Greater Wisconsin Whatever Coalition. They call them, so, coalition. Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. you know, it was WMC and the Coalition for Families and whatever silly names they want to give these, mm -hmm. you know, 527 groups, the plain fact is, as a friend of mine said, the WEAC people weren't as good as the WMC people. The candidates don't count anymore. Right, right. The candidates don't count. And who wants to be a candidate if you don't, I mean, you have it no used control. to be you would, you would say, I'm running for office, this is what I believe in, and vote for me or don't vote for me. 
Now you say, I'm going to put my name on the ballot, and then I could go on a vacation for four months because I am going to be defined. There's going to be some caricature created about me and of me that may have no relationship to reality, and I can't do anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. You lost control over you your message. You totally lost control sure. over your own race. Mm -hmm. Newspaper reports said that Butler repeatedly asked groups that were campaigning for him or advertising for him to, as he said, stand down. Now, I don't know if those were, I mean, that would have been political suicide if they had really stood down because then there would have been no answer to the barrage. More than $2 million spent on the, I was going to say on the Republican side, more than $2 million spent on the Gableman side and less on, on Butler's, but still considerable funds. But it's true, you could go on vacation. Right. You have no control. You aren't defining the issues. It's not about you. It's about various political it's about, groups. It's a struggle for power, and you're just a pawn. So if and WM's... The point with WEAC and this, they need to get better at it. Well, the, the better <laughs> meaning, but let's be clear what better is. Better means worse. Exactly. I mean, in this Orwellian exactly. conversation we're exactly. having now, exactly. is you have to be even more outrageous so that by the end it's both, you know, you destroyed the village to save the Yeah, you know, I mean, you have to out Willie Horton yeah. the other side. <clears throat> and there was a sort of a feeble attempt to say, okay, now that the agenda is who's weak on criminals, whatever the heck that means, because they're not criminals until they're convicted, last time I checked in this constitution. Um, so they even tried to, they tried to make Gableman look just as you know, weak on criminals Well, that dog didn't hunt. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is people don't realize what the justice system is like. They don't understand that plea bargaining is a critical piece of the system. They don't understand that judges never, well, rarely at, do what the district attorney wants because the district attorney always asks for more and the public defender always asks for less and it's a question of doing justice in the middle, usually, not always. They don't understand you know, what appeals are and what the Supreme Court does and how those issues get there. So there needs to be some education, I think, in the populace. A lot of education. A lot of education just about and what the judges judiciary judges are not supposed to announce their platform that I'm going to vote pro-business or pro-union. Well, You're and, in there as a jurist who's supposed to know the law and the Constitution. And one of the things, and this is changing a little bit, but where we saw in the uh, uh, appellate race, uh, Lisa Neubauer and, oh, uh, and Bill, Bill Gleisner. Gleisner. And he was basically saying how he was going to decide. If, if you elect me, I am pro-life, yeah. I'm this, yeah. I'm this, I'm this. That was just, that was the strangest thing. Well, Bill Gleisner was an amicus uh, a brief writer for the Wisconsin Association of Trial Lawyers, which gave him all of his money. He's a liberal guy. He, <laughs> yes. You know, and so... That chameleon tried to change his color and it didn't work. <laughs> that chameleon don't hunt. And, uh, and I was surprised because I thought, you know, Sheboygan County is getting conservative, although nobody really knew what conservative was because Lisa Neubauer, married to Jeff Neubauer, former chair of the Democratic Party, and yet is a litigation partner at Foley and Lardner, representing insurance companies and presumably pretty Republican types for years. You know, she's a skilled litigator. Um, she wins the county parallel to the state, 63%, and, uh, and uh, to Gleisner's 38%. Marilyn, it must have been because you and I endorsed her. <laughs> That's the only reason. You well, know, another I, downside to all of this is how do you get good lawyers to run for a court position in the future? Who'd want to put their family and themselves yeah. through this baloney? I don't think many people would. And then you end up getting the Gablemans. Yeah. You know, the guy's not I married. I heard he was 18th on the list. Um, you know, <laughs> and everybody else says 18. no, right. And finally said, okay, I'll put my name up. Because it doesn't make any difference what you believe or how, how good right. a judge you are. That's right. It's what kind of ad campaign they're going to run. Exactly, exactly. And well, I, it really does put a, uh, cr it really does have a dampening effect on judges running for the next level up. Yeah. Because or who want to run. Be or who want to run. Every decision. Now, how could yep, an exactly. independent group take this decision yep. and say I'm anti-crime or whatever. And, and that gets dangerous. So. I mean, fundamentally, uh, until the Supreme Court of the United States guts the exclusionary rule, we, we make our police respect the Bill of Rights by, from time to time, when they wander off, as human beings do, as James Madison said, we, when they wander off the plantation and they don't follow the rules the Constitution requires them to follow, we say you can't use that evidence, and that puts the 
government at a disadvantage. Well, you, we rely on judges to be the referee. That's right. And if you're thinking in the back of your head, someday I want to be an appellate judge or someday I want to move up, but this may mean that someday this one case out of the thousands of cases that I hear in a county court or a circuit court is going to come back to haunt me. I mean, that's, that's just really thinking. difficult. You, know, you yep. can be right on 999. You can have something that you might even be right on, but it, it, it just can be tweaked a little bit, and all of a sudden that one case becomes what your opponent runs on exactly. and tries to define you as. Yeah, and I was just telling my friends, do we really want to have a system of you government? <laughs> Some. Oh, that's, a I'm few. a guest here. I'm sorry. Or they're making believe. <laughs> well, look at they're making believe. That, that was pretty good. Yeah. I like that. I'm not used to it from that side of the room. <laughs> I know. I'm used to it over here. <laughs> now I got a two front war. I was, I was uh, to an acquaintance. <laughs> that, do you really want to have a system of government where the judge determines what rights you have based upon his perception of whether you're guilty or not? Or her perception. Ooh, yeah. yeah. yeah right. Really? Well, speaking of hers and ju judges, um, and I think it was timed with some vigor, uh, Shirley Abrahamson announced her decision to run for re-election the day, I think it was the day after the election, uh, the Gableman-Butler um, fiasco, and um, so she will be running for her fourth tenure term or her fifth? A I don't. long time. A long yeah. time. And, yeah. and justices are elected for ten years, um, trial court and appellate court judges are elected for six years. Um, and um, probably her fourth, which would mean she'd have been on 39 years. Except, was she appointed initially, or did she get on the first time by running? I think she was appointed. So many of the judges so, are. Yeah, you know. and that's that's a typical path. And she's been chief justice now ever since Nat Heffernan retired. And um, um, she's a remarkable justice. She has a mind that mm -hmm. is stunningly bright, and uh, she is well educated. She's a delight to listen to. She's thoughtful. Um, she's one of my favorites. But Plus, she was a guest on our show. And she was a guest on our show. I had forgotten Can't about get that. Better than that. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And she didn't even like rule you out of order, which you know clearly well, would have been appropriate. She was very tolerant. She was incredibly tolerant. So in any event, so we like well, there's Shirley a drawback right there. Abrahamson. At least some of us do on the on the Donahue group. But um, well, I think she's. That. I think she's just saying, "Come after me." Come after me because, you know, this may be my last term. She's in her late 70s, and uh, which is like the median age for the U.S. Supreme Court. She'd be one of the youngsters <laughs> on the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> on the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and uh, I think I think this is my my view of it. Is she's just saying, bring them on, because well, I'm going to fight let's, back. Let's hope that in the special session that's still on, uh, we can get at least public financing of the Supreme Court races. I'm not, I would hope that people on both sides have got such a bad taste in their mouth right now that we've got to do better than this and hope we could, before the next race, we can move at least that part of the, the financing uh, puzzle into the public sector. What I'd really like is if, Justice Abramson, if you're listening. Um, I'm sure she will be. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would really like her to say, I will refuse to align myself in any fashion with 527 ads. I will move heaven and earth to make sure they don't do anything for me, and I challenge my opponent to do the same. And that Except would be you have no control over that. I know. You have, you're not even supposed to talk to those folks. Right. 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 Or coordinate That's campaigns right. or messages or but anything. But she could do an ad that says, this, people who support me and I appreciate their support I don't want them to do this. This needs to be an election about issues, and, well, and that's I, my dream. <laughs> I, I think she'll do very well. I think, as you said, she's highly regarded. The other thing is just the, the nature of the Supreme Court. Uh, it was four to three, if you want to classify, liberals. And so this was a battle by the conservatives to try to get one liberal seat. Now they have four to three. Surely Abramson is, is one of the three. So it doesn't make, there won't be a change whether she loses or wins. And I think just the fact that she's Chief Justice, she's so regarded. But it is interesting because as you said, it's a 10 year term, there's seven justices. So it, as, as long as it's close, when you have it where it can tip the court one way or the other, that's when they get contentious. So this was a contentious one. Abramson, I don't think will be, the next year is an off year, and then Prosser, who, you know, and then you'll, potentially have 
the more liberal side. Though the other thing that happens, uh, as Mary Lynn said, is so often you get appointments in there. That's, that's how so many of, of the Supreme Court justices get on the first time. Well, and a thoughtful justice rules different ways at different times depending on right. the particular facts that come mm -hmm. before the court. Right. And they do try to choose cases that Rather have wide coming application. Rather in with a mindset and they don't bother me with the facts. They yeah. listen and they, they digest the facts. And generally we have very, very bright justices on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And so they can process information and so forth. I mean, Prosser is a very bright guy. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but what I'd like to see is the requirement that all 527 contributions be listed. And so then in a Supreme Court race, anyone who has contributed to one of those justices' campaigns would have to, the justice would have to recuse him or herself. So pretty soon we would have a court that couldn't rule on anything. Uh, anything. And maybe that would, oh well. I'm, be, I'm beginning to I'm fantasize. Dreaming. I am dreaming. But, Let's you know, talk. That, that maybe is where you even started with the 527s, where you just have to have that transparency and say, okay, we may, you know, yeah. because of, of speech issues, uh, we may not be able to stop you. But we certainly can say you have to show if you contributed. And, and if you're a recipient of it, you show your donor list. Uh, right. there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. From a purely political point of view, and I was out of the... I was on break in the last week leading up to the election, so I wasn't around to watch TV. Did Justice Butler ever do an ad where he looks into the camera and talks about, this is what I really do, and address the loophole Louis argument? Because well, I, I think, think that's what's going to have to happen with Shirley. She's got the gravitas, yeah. and I'm sure Justice yeah. Butler did as well. And I just don't know if he did that. And he kind of made a joke of it. And he yeah, said loophole Louis strategy. was his kind of an affectionate term. And that, that was a mistake, I think. Yeah. Because I think really that's what's going to have to happen, because you can't control these groups uh, no matter how much you, you know, stand and say, I don't want you to be involved in our races. I think you almost have to, without talking about how you rule on cases, you really have to use your campaign ads as a way to educate the public about what really goes on in the Supreme Court and, and address those kinds of issues. And somebody like Averson can do that. So mm -hmm. what if she wins 60-40 instead of 80-20? She'll win and she can try to make a statement. I hope, well, I hope you remember, gave her that advice. But you'll remember that her last campaign, um, or two campaigns ago, against Sharon Rose uh, from Green Bay was highly contentious. That's right. And Sharon Rose went after the Chief Justice with everything she had. That was an ugly race. But they were funding it themselves. And we were talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars instead of millions really? and millions. Right. So well, let's move. <sighs> take a deep breath, <laughs> put our dismay and our outrage down in a little corner here and talk about something else that can steam us up. Like the legislature. <laughs> Wait, we don't, they're still in special. We have one? We do. Okay. They're still in special session. Mm -hmm. um, Cal, what's going on, if well, anything? Well, they adjourned their regular session, I think, in the end of uh, March. And it was a very nondescript session. Um, very few bills passed, of course, because you have a Democratic uh, Senate and Republican uh, Assembly. And as a result, uh, most of the bills passed one house and not the other. And... Uh, what you have now is the special session that the governor called way back in, what, January? Mm -hmm. December. Where it, yeah, it was December. Yeah. And he, uh, at that time, put on public financing of campaigns or campaign reform, um, but added most recently the fact uh, uh, that we need a budget review bill because the two-year budget is going to be up to $500 million out of balance if we did not have a budget review bill. and so. The, the session thus far has not passed uh, very much. <laughs> They've got the uh, budget review bill passing the Senate as the governor pretty well appropriated the, uh, the bill. And then now the assembly that will, I think, say we're gonna cut taxes, uh, we're gonna cut spending, we're gonna be the conservative and it will go to some type of uh, conference committee and hopefully with the government, governor intervening and compromising to some extent, uh, we'll eventually get a budget review bill passed, but it will not be like what the governor and the Senate uh, came up with. But and the uh, political climate for campaign reform, I don't know what will happen. Of course, as we get further and further towards campaigns, there's very little interest in debating whether the things they're involved in at that particular time are illegal or bad public policy because they want to garner as much special interest money as they can. Uh, the only thing that's really out there, and I would, if I were the governor, 
I would bring up this Supreme Court race, and I would say, you guys are not going to go home and to campaign or go any place until you do something substantive about public financing of court races. And I would call them back 10 times if I have to, simply because I think the editorial, hopefully, boards around the state would be on the governor's side to say this thing stunk to high heaven, and we need, at least if we can't agree to legislative uh, public financing, we can do it for the court system. Yeah. And take that road and just beat it as much as you can. But, but not, I don't know what the governor is yeah. going to ultimately do. And, and maybe on the, on the court races, but you're not going to get substantive uh, campaign finance reform in a campaign no. year. Uh, you've got to do it in off year. And, and as we mentioned, as long as these 527s uh, operate with impunity yeah. and, and in total secrecy, um, it, 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 it seems to be... Well, part Not of the whole campaign reform relevant. would be disclosure of the names yeah. of, the, of the funders rather than the Citizens for Families or some right. baloney like that. I mean, yeah. that is, it, just, it really ticks you off to have anybody say that this, this ad that literally assassinated verbally somebody uh, is paid for by <laughs> a group representing families. You know, my gosh. Well, what an insult. But, but the other issue that's pretty serious, I think, is, is the state budget. Uh, you know, the, the legislature and the governor have always uh, gone in and they've kind of said, okay, this is our expected revenue and we spend almost all of it. There's very little rainy day fund and then there's generally fairly positive revenue growth projections in there. You get this recession and if it gets worse, uh, you're not only going to get no revenue growth, you could have a revenue shortfall and that $500 million, uh, it could be more. Sure. And that's going to work its way through. Schools and cities and counties will be saying, well, we're losing revenue. I mean, property, if property taxes go, go down, uh, well, you can raise the rate, but that gets people mad. Oh, it sure does. Um, and so they're going to be a little bit low, and they'll be looking to the state, and the state won't have any money. Um, and, and we're this can be serious. We're in a climate now where even if the, the hospital tax, for example, which the hospital association is in favor of because it will be reimbursed by the federal government and so forth, is that legislators have painted themselves into a corner about no new taxes. Um, and so even something that's pretty rational and good public policy just isn't going to play well in the pander circuit. And so, you know, those kinds of things won't be taken advantage of, and, and that's really too bad. We just have one minute left. Maybe we should, we should just briefly talk about the Frankenstein veto, which oh, I, think, yes. uh, I think was great. Uh, Passed you know, by a huge you're margin. Whether you're a Democratic governor or a Republican governor, it got to the point where it was outrageous, where literally the governor could write policy with his stroke of a pen, and uh, I think it's, it's good that this thing passed. Yeah, it was, it was bad when McCallum did it. It was bad when Tommy Thompson did it, the master. It was bad when Doyle did it, so, um, and passed 71%, uh, I think. Uh, so at least uh, the Frankenstein veto <laughs> is, it just is gone. Part of the... You know, it's Wisconsin Constitution, or is it another? Does it have to go another year? No, I no, think I got this lost is it. in the process. It, it, uh, re the referendum had to pass two successive sessions. Right. Then it voted upon. Then it goes into effect. Okay. Yeah. And and there's still a pretty strong veto power for the governor. It's oh, just sure. that that just the you words can't can do some of it. You yeah. can't change. It still has line yeah. item authority. Well, yes. Mm -hmm. The Frankenstein veto is done, and so are we. Thank you all. We'll see you again. <laughs>